writer in the 17th century and a poet in the 18th century both articulated the same thought, a phrase that has been quoted and misquoted over the years. It's the idea that a little knowledge is a dangerous thing. And many of us are familiar with that expression. We understand what they were trying to tell us. Sometimes we know just enough to get ourselves into trouble. What we know may be true, but we don't know the whole story. We don't have all the facts. We have incomplete data, so the conclusions that we make may be incorrect. And how many times has that happened to people? How many times has that happened to us? How many relationships have been damaged or even destroyed because of that? And when it comes to spiritual things, when it comes to the things of the Lord, those consequences can be catastrophic. If we only have part of the story of salvation, if we only know part of it, those consequences will be eternal. And how many people are walking around like that today with just a little knowledge of Christ, with just enough to deceive them into thinking they are okay? They just have enough knowledge to think that they are on their way to heaven and they don't see, they don't understand their need of a Savior. A little knowledge is a dangerous thing. And even if we know Christ, but we don't know his word, how do we know? How do we understand how to effectively live for him so we do not continually disgrace him? It is true. A little knowledge can certainly be a dangerous thing for all of us. And that's a lesson that we all need to learn. And it is a lesson that two of the disciples of Jesus learned late on the Sunday afternoon of his resurrection. Throughout his ministry, Jesus had told his disciples what would happen to him, didn't he? Matthew chapter 16, Matthew chapter 17, he told them that when he went to Jerusalem, it would not be to free them from their oppressors. He would not free the nation of Israel from their enemies. But instead, he would go there to suffer. He would go there to be rejected by the ones he had come to save. And he would die. He would be killed by them. But then, he said, he would rise from the grave after three days. Nothing is impossible for God. But in the minds of those disciples, those words were perhaps a distant memory. Jesus was dead. He had been betrayed by one of his own. He had been abandoned by all of them, by all of his disciples. And then he had been tortured, and he had been executed, brutally executed by the Romans. And the leaders of the nation of Israel had made sure that happened. And his own people, the children of Israel, had consented to all of it. And the disciples, perhaps, were thinking, maybe we're next. That was on their mind on that Friday, on that day that Christ was crucified. That was on their mind on that Saturday as Jesus lay in the grave. And that was on their mind early Sunday morning on that third day. What were they to do? What were they to do now without Jesus? It seemed like it was over. And so Luke says in Luke chapter 24, verse 13, 
Behold. Idu in Greek. Pay attention to what I'm about to say because what I'm about to say is important. He says two of them. Two of the disciples of Jesus, not two of the twelve, they were still in Jerusalem. But two disciples who had decided to leave Jerusalem on that day, on Sunday. Passover feast was over. Jesus had been killed at the feast. So these two disciples decided to leave town. So it says in verse 13 that they were going poruomai in Greek. They were traveling. They were walking. They were on their way that very day, Sunday afternoon. And it said they were heading west. They were going to a village called Emmaus. We don't know if they lived there. We don't know if that was just their first stop on their journey. We're not even sure exactly where Emmaus was located because there is no evidence of it today. But we do know this, that it was a village that was seven miles from Jerusalem, about a two-hour journey on foot. And we don't really know that much about these two disciples either. We know one of them was named Cleopas. That's a Hebrew name. It's a man's name. But what about the other one? Was that his wife? Or was that just a traveling companion who was leaving town at the same time? And they were traveling together. Both of them traveling in the same direction. Luke doesn't tell us. So as they're walking along this dirt road and they're heading west, verse 14 says they were were talking. They were conversing with each other. Now, what were they talking about? Verse 14 says they were having a conversation about all these things, tauto in Greek, about, about the facts, about the events, about their opinions, their feelings, about all which had taken place, sumbino in Greek. It, what had just occurred in Jerusalem in reference to Jesus. That's what they were talking about. And there certainly was enough to talk about, wasn't there? All they had seen over these days, all that they had heard, his triumphal entry into the city of Jerusalem with thousands of people shouting and praising God, declaring him to be their king. Perhaps they remembered when Jesus entered into the temple and he drove out those who were polluting God's house because of their greed, because of their hypocrisy. He was a king. But then, he was dead, executed. How could this have happened this way? And perhaps as they recalled these things, Their eyes were filled with tears, weeping over their Lord. They were struggling. None of this made any sense. We can understand that, can't we? Life doesn't make sense sometimes. And so it says in verse 15 that it came about that while they were conversing and discussing these things, suzeteo in Greek, they were questioning each other, trying to, trying to figure this all out. They didn't have any answers. They just wonder what had happened. How could Jesus be the Messiah? He was dead. Wasn't the Messiah supposed to rule? Wasn't he supposed to reign in Israel? That's what they had been taught by their leaders. So they were confused. And they were distressed. They didn't know that Jesus had already appeared to a group of women at the tomb, did they? They didn't know that he had appeared to Mary Magdalene. They didn't know he had appeared to Simon Peter. They didn't know that he was alive. 
And they didn't know the scriptures. They didn't know the word of God. And so, as they are walking along together, verse 15 says, Jesus himself, who was alive from the dead, a living, breathing person, he was walking along that same road, and it says he approached an egizo. He caught up to them. And he started traveling along with them. He started walking alongside of them. There were many people on that road who were leaving Jerusalem after the Passover feast. And it was not uncommon for strangers to walk together as they traveled. But these two disciples didn't know who this stranger was. They didn't recognize him. Verse 16 says why. It says their eyes were prevented from recognizing him. Krateo in Greek. By God's will, God's plan, they could not see who he was. They could not see who was walking alongside of them. He appeared just to be a man. And they certainly weren't expecting Jesus to be there, were they? They thought he was dead. Comfort for us to know that whether we know it or not, Jesus is here. He walks alongside of us. Hebrew 13, 5 says he'll never leave us. He'll never forsake us. Even in our darkest hour. Even in our misunderstanding. Even in our pain. He promises to be with us here. Now. And so, as he's walking along with them... He's listening to them speak. Joined in the conversation. Imagine that. And he said to them in verse 17, what are these words? What are these remarks that you are exchanging with one another? Antibalo in Greek. What are you, uh, what are you tossing back and forth like a ball? You're throwing these thoughts back and forth as you're walking along this road. And though you may be sincere, you seem to lack understanding. You seem to to lack a firm foundation in what you are saying, in your thoughts, in your words. Jesus were to ask us that question. What would we say? How would we answer him? What is the topic of our conversation with each other? And do we have a firm foundation for our words? Well, just like those two disciples, he knows what we say. He knows. He hears everything. And so, as he is listening to them speak, he asks them a question. He asks them a question. He... He wanted to understand. He wanted to draw out some information from them. And so they stopped walking. They stood still. It says in verse 17, Esta Thesan. They stopped in their tracks right in the middle of the road. And they stood there for a moment. It says, looking, looking sad. Their eyes were full of despair. It was like the weight of the world was on their shoulders. They had no hope. These two disciples had been greatly affected by what had just happened. So why didn't Jesus just tell them who he was? Why didn't he reveal himself to them right then? Certainly would have comforted them, right? Because he's about to teach them something. He's about to teach us something. He's about to teach us where we can go to find the truth. He's about to help us to understand where we can get answers. Where we can get hope. Where we can get comfort. He's about to reveal himself through his word. That's where we're to go. John 5.39, what did he say? He said, the scriptures... 
the Old Testament scriptures at that point. Those were the only scriptures that uh, had been written when he said those words. He said, they testify of me. Do you hear that? They speak of me. To read the Old Testament and not to see Christ is to miss the point of those scriptures. Jesus Christ is the theme of the Old Testament. He is the theme of the entire Bible from cover to cover. And because these two disciples were blinded by their ignorance of the Scripture, because of their lack of knowledge of the Word of God, they only had despair. That's an important thing to remember. A little knowledge is a dangerous thing. We need to know the entire word of God. Why? So we can understand the truth. So we can understand the way things really are, the way they are according to God's perspective. And Christ is about to give them light. He is about to illuminate their minds. How? Through his word. That's the way he reveals himself. Through his word. And that is why he does not let them know at this point who he is. He wants them to focus on the word of God. That is where he reveals himself to us. And one of them, verse 18 says, one of those disciples named Cleopas, answered this stranger. And he said to to him, are you the only one who is visiting Jerusalem? Who is unaware of the things that have just happened here in these days? Have you been isolated from everyone and everything? If you have, you're probably the only one. Because everybody in Jerusalem knows the things that have happened. What's Jesus' answer? Verse 19. He said to them, both of them, what things? Puyos in Greek. What sort of things? What is so important to you that it has affected you so greatly? It's an interesting question, isn't it? Verse 19 says, not only Cleopas, says both of them responded. And they both said to him, the things concerning Jesus of Nazareth, the Nazarene. He was a prophet. He spoke for God. He was mighty dunatos. He was powerful. He was effective. Both in deed, he healed the sick, he raised the dead, and in word. No one ever spoke the way that he spoke. He was mighty. He spoke with the words of God himself. All he said, all he did, he did, they said, in the sight, in the presence of God and before all the people. There was no one like Jesus. Then, at the Passover, when they thought that he would be proclaimed king, a terrible thing happened, they said. The chief priests and our rulers, all of the leaders of our nation, delivered him up. They handed him over to the Romans. And they made sure that he was condemned to the sentence, to the judgment of death. And then they crucified him. But we believed, we thought, we hoped, they said, El El Piso. We had confidence. We were expecting and we were sure that he was the one who was going to redeem Israel. Lutro, he was going to deliver us. He was going to rescue us from the power, from the oppression 
of our enemies. From the bondage of Rome. Indeed, they said, we thought that this was true. And besides all this, verse 21, it is the third day. It's, been, it's the third day since all of these things have happened. And it's almost the end of the day. And as far as we know, Jesus is still dead. So we're still without hope. But early this morning, they said, we received a report. Some women among us, followers of Jesus, they amazed us with an incredible story. When they were at the tomb early in the morning to anoint the body of Jesus, the tomb was empty. They didn't find his body anywhere. And so they came to the disciples, it says, Er Ercomai. They brought the news to them. And they said something else. They said that they had seen a vision. A vision of angels. Angels had appeared to them and spoke to them. And they said that the reason that the tomb was empty was because Jesus had risen from the dead. He was alive. And some of those who were with us, two of the leading disciples, Peter, John, both of them, they went to the tomb themselves. And they found it exactly as the women had said. The tomb was, in fact, empty. But Jesus, says in verse 24, they did not see. What could all this mean? So, as the three of them, Jesus and these two disciples, are walking along that road together late on the Sunday afternoon of his resurrection, Jesus said this to them, verse 25. Oh, foolish men, anoetos, you who have no comprehension. You're like little children. You have no understanding of spiritual things. You are slow of heart to believe. You have a spirit of, of doubt and of unbelief in what, he says, in all that the prophets spoke in the scriptures. Look to the word of God. You have an inadequate knowledge of the scriptures. Read the scriptures. The word speaks clearly, and it speaks decisively of these things. Was it not necessary, Jesus said? Didn't this need to happen according to what? According to the scriptures. Didn't it need to happen for your salvation? For the Christ to suffer these things? What disturbs you is his death. But according to the scriptures, it is his death that is the evidence, that is the proof that he is the Messiah. And now, because of his death, Your sins are forgiven. So now he is able to enter into his glory, into the glory of heaven, into the majesty that is his. He can sit down at the right hand of God in power and glory with a name above every name. And so, this stranger says to them, beginning with Moses who wrote the first five books of the Bible. And continuing, he says, through what? All the prophets. All the prophets in the Old Testament. He explained to them the things concerning himself in all the scriptures. Dear Mentuo, he gave them the sense of them. 
He interpreted scripture for them. He helped them to understand the meaning of the word. He spoke of the depth of our sin, but he spoke of the deeper love of our Savior. How in Genesis, an innocent animal had to be slaughtered and sacrificed, its blood shed to cover the nakedness, the spiritual nakedness, the disobedience, the sin of Adam and Eve. How in Isaiah 53.10 it says that a life would be given, that a life needed to be given as an offering for sin. A picture given in the story of Noah How we need to run to the ark. How we need to run to Christ to escape the flood, to escape the judgment of God. It is Christ who is pictured in all of those sacrifices found in the book of Leviticus. In all of those offerings, those animals that were slain on the altar. It's a picture of him. Leviticus 17.11 says that without the pouring out of blood, there's no forgiveness of sin because the life of the flesh is in the blood. That's his blood. It's the blood of bulls and goats. He is the sacrifice that was given for our forgiveness. He is the Lamb of God found in Exodus chapter 12 whose blood was poured out in order to save the firstborn from death. He is the one pictured in Zechariah, it says, who was pierced, forsaken by God, forsaken by man, betrayed by a friend, hated without a cause. It says that in the Psalms. All of the scripture. All of the Old Testament, page after page, book after book, all points to Christ. And you know, we can see what those two disciples saw on that day as that stranger opened up the scriptures to them because... The Spirit of Christ will open up those same scriptures to us. He will give us understanding. Everything that has happened has happened according to the plan of God. It is all part of His divine will, and it's all found in His Word. There's no reason for despair. It's all here. It's all in the Word of God. So, verse 28 says... As they approached the village of Emmaus, where they were going, and I'm sure that time went rather quickly, Jesus acted as though prosopoio, he gave the impression that he was going to continue further. He's going to keep traveling. He wasn't going to stop unless they invited him in. That's interesting, isn't it? But these two disciples were unlike those people we find in in the church at Laodicea in Revelation chapter 3. Jesus was outside the door. But these two disciples invited him in to fellowship with him, to share some time together. And so it says they urged him, parabizoma, they... They kept speaking to him, appealing to him, begging him, and saying to him, please, stay with us. Stay here for the night, for it's getting towards evening, it's getting late, it's getting dark out. The day is nearly over. And so what did he do? Verse 29 says he went in. He went in with them to perhaps continue the Bible lesson. And verse 30 says, it came about that when he had reclined at the table, he was there with them for supper. He did something very unusual. He was their guest. But he did what the host would normally do at supper. He took the bread and he gave thanks 
He blessed it and gave thanks to God, and then it says, breaking it, he began giving it to them, and then a truly amazing thing happened. Verse 31 says, their eyes were open. Di Neugel, God gave them spiritual insight and revealed the truth to them, and they recognized him. It was their Lord. He was sitting, reclining at the table with them. He's alive. And that simple meal became a sacred encounter with God. And at that very moment, it says, he vanished from their sight. He was gone. Now they really had something to talk about. And they said to one another, verse 32, were not our hearts, our minds, our spirits, our entire being just burning within us, Kyomene. It was like we were on fire, a blaze overflowing with joy and with peace and with understanding while he was doing what? It says while he was speaking to them on the road and explaining the scriptures to them. That's why he didn't reveal himself to them on the road. He wanted them to look to the scriptures and find him. That's where we find him. And we will experience that fire. As the truth of the word of God burns within us. And we see Jesus. He'll reveal himself to anyone who honestly seeks him. He'll reveal himself through his word. And he will allow himself to be found, and we will fellowship with him, with the risen Christ. And even though it was dark, and even though the road could be dangerous at night, verse 33 tells us that those two disciples arose. They got up from the table. It says at that very hour, aura, at that moment. Now what did they do? It says they returned to Jerusalem. They returned with good news. The Lord is risen. The Lord is risen indeed. Forever it is so. Amen. And amen. You've been listening to Bruce David Bell, pastor of Borean Bible Fellowship. If the Lord has ministered to you through this message and you would like more information, then visit us on the web at bbfva.org.